Have you ever been falsely accused of something you didn't do? There's this terrible feeling of betrayal and humiliation, of deception, and almost always it results in anger. So what's the normal human reaction? Denial, self-defense, and often a disproportionate sense of a great injustice taking place. And perhaps you're the only one who knows that you're innocent and this can lead to alienation and rejection by others as you hold to the truth. And suddenly trusted friends become your enemies because they believe the lie and would prefer to believe that you're capable of doing wrong when you are completely innocent. The trials and accusations that were made against Jesus are listed in Matthew 26. Let's pray as we come now to Matthew chapter 27. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask today on this day that we call Good Friday, that Lord, we would have a deeper and a newer understanding of what Jesus did for us, the extent to which he went to make sure that the sins that we commit are paid for and forgiven and justified. Lord, help us to embrace the new life that is found in trusting in Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we come to Matthew 27, we see that Jesus, in this final appearance before Pontius Pilate, his reaction is quite remarkable. Pilate has failed to find anything substantial against Jesus, but he does a, a, a he does pursue this accusation of blasphemy by the Sanhedrin. And he asks Jesus the question, are you the king of the Jews? He shrinks back from a direct accusation that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. But even his question can only suggest one conclusion, that king and Messiah mean the same thing. And Jesus' reply is simple and it's easily interpreted as agreement. Jesus has previously referred to himself as the Son of Man, which is another messianic title, but it's less inflammatory to his enemies. He can't deny who he is. He must answer yes to Pilate's question, even in the indirect manner he used. You say that I am. Jesus cannot lie. But beyond that, Jesus has nothing more to say. It's just as the prophet Isaiah wrote hundreds of years before. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. Isaiah 53, 7. If ever there was a miscarriage of justice in the history of this world, this would have to rank as the greatest example. And yet, the reply of Jesus is surprisingly tame, given that he is innocent of this charge of blasphemy. And why is he innocent? Because it's true. He is the Messiah. There's nothing blasphemous about that. He is the king of the Jews. Only a few days before, Jesus entered Jerusalem to the accolades of people who wanted to make him king. And now it's the same crowds who are crying for his blood, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. But Jesus has nothing more to say. In verse 14, Matthew records, not even to a single charge. In these circumstances, the very human reaction would be to strongly renounce the charges and declare innocence. Not so with Jesus. Pilate is reluctantly convinced of Jesus' innocence. His wife warns him that Jesus is innocent. And even Pilate tries to trade Jesus' life for another prisoner, Barabbas. But yet he's looking for political advantage. He wants to keep favour with the religious leaders. And in a final demonstration of frustration, he literally washes his hands, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. 
and ironically, they answer by accepting that responsibility. His blood is on us and our children. What a terrible thing to say. But it isn't over yet. The suffering of Jesus has only really just begun. We look at Matthew 27 from 27, verse 27 onwards. He was stripped, he was mocked, a crown of thorns was forced upon his head, he was spat upon, he was struck repeatedly on the head with a staff, and finally amidst abuse and mockery, he was nailed to the cross. In Mark's Gospel, he also adds that Jesus was whipped. Many years ago, I watched the Mel Gibson production, The Passion of the Christ. There were many critics of this film saying it was too graphic and it over-exaggerated the suffering of Jesus. Now, I agree that blood and violence were extreme, but on reflection, I think it was a reasonable depiction of what Jesus went through, just as Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 52, 14. At the end of the film, and this was the first screening in the entire world, so no one knew how it would end. We sat there, totally silent, stunned. Several hundred people in that cinema, and every one of us had the same reaction. Not one person said anything, and nobody moved for about four or five minutes. We just sat there in stunned silence. And slowly, one by one, still in silence, we got up and we left. And we didn't even engage in small talk all the way back to our cars, not until we were well away from the venue, because we realised we had seen an accurate depiction of the truth about the suffering of Christ. I once visited an old blind man he had given up the will to live and he'd refused to eat, saying to his wife he had nothing to live for. She called me and so I went and talked to him and I prayed with him. And I learned him a recording of Matthew's Gospel and I convinced him that he had much to live for, wonderful grandchildren, and even if his life was yet to be short, he had plenty to live for. A week later I visited him again. And he shared with me that he listened to the tape of Matthew's Gospel and he couldn't get past this part where Jesus was tried and crucified. He said, it's just so wrong. It's not fair. How could such an injustice like this happen? But more importantly, why? Why would Jesus go through all of this? James was his name. And he passed away a few months later. But during those couple of months, he was able to come to the understanding of why Jesus did this. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. Of course, I was able to say to him, the story had a happy ending with the resurrection of Christ. And it is through that resurrection that we have the same hope that in the future, we too will be raised up. But it does bid the question, why did Jesus endure such pain and humiliation? Why didn't he claim his innocence? Surely he didn't deserve to die simply for claiming to be the king of the Jews. Why? He did it for you and for me. This was the sole purpose for the coming of God into human history, to become one of us and do what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus, essentially, was born to die. Not only did he become a human being, but he went through the same temptations, the same trials that you and I go through. Yes, he knew human existence most intimately. He experienced physical pain. He experienced emotional pain, just like us. Read the Gospel accounts. Very, very clearly we see the things that Jesus went through as a human being. But then he suffered the ultimate humiliation. He died a most ignoble death on a cross. 
and he passed into death, where he suffered probably what is real hell, the absence of God the Father. Nothing can be more terrible than that. Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. He paid the price of our sins, or as the prophet puts it, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. God's justice demands that our sins be paid for by a blood sacrifice. But God's mercy decides that God himself pays the price. Jesus did it because this is what was required for us to be freed from the penalty of our sins. And even though he was completely innocent and never committed any sin, Jesus willingly obeyed and paid with his own blood, not the blood of cows or goats. The writer to the Hebrews writes this, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Jesus knew from the beginning of his ministry that this is how it would end. But in many ways, it is not the end, it is but the beginning. Because it is through his blood, Jesus has secured for every person who trusts in him to have eternal life. Through confession of faith in Jesus, we have access to forgiveness of our sins and a life that never ends together with Jesus himself. What was Jesus' motive? He did it for love. The Apostle John wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What a wonderful promise. As God created humankind to have fellowship with him and to enjoy his presence, he loves all of creation. And God wants nothing to separate us from him. But due to our sin, that fellowship is broken, and unless there is some intervention, we can no longer relate to God, nor can we relate to one another. But because of his great love for us, God sent his son to be one of us and finally give his life so that we might live and restore the relationship we once had with God. This is the heart of the Easter story. This is why we call it Good Friday. God mending a broken relationship which we broke but were unable to fix. God has done it through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross and by his wonderful resurrection to conquer death. If you haven't already experienced God's love and forgiveness, today is a good opportunity to reach out and ask God to give you that life that he has won for us. Ask him today to forgive you and know that you are forgiven because of Jesus' blood. Receive the life that is freely given to you and begin to walk in faith following Jesus. This is a great opportunity. But if you already know God's loving kindness in your life, if you've experienced that love, today is a good opportunity to reach out in faith and reaffirm to the Lord that you are his. Reach out to others and share with them how you have found new life. You have found love and joy and peace through knowing that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour. And especially in these troubled times when there's so much despair and fear everywhere, call someone today and offer to pray with them 
Bring to them the comfort and hope and the joy that you have found in knowing Jesus. Be light in the darkness. Be hope in the midst of fear and despair. This is Good Friday and it's good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through Jesus, through what he did for us on the cross, through his suffering and pain, we have new life in him. We have restored to us that eternal life that you once gave to the first man and woman. And that, Lord, this is what you want for each one of us, to come back into that wonderful relationship of love and peace and joy with you. Help us this day, Lord, to be used by you to, to share this wonderful message with others, to explain why we call this day, this terrible day, when you died on the cross, why we call it Good Friday. Lord, use us to share this good news. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.